listening to WPVM 103.7 on your dial and at WPVMFM.org globally. I am your host, Crystal Salinas McKinnon, and tonight we're doing the second in our series of live interviews for the NC11 congressional race with Democratic candidate Jay Carey, who's joining me in the studio tonight. Jay is a 20 plus year veteran of the United States Army and a resident of Hendersonville, North Carolina. So welcome Jay. How long have you been here in Western North Carolina? <laughs> well, I got here about three years ago, a little over three years ago. And like I like to say, I couldn't get here fast enough. Yeah. And we love it. We have, <laughs> we've had a son since we've lived here. We own, some, we own a home in a beautiful area. So you have a native child now of, <laughs> of the area um so any candidate who takes on the sitting congressman uh, madison coffin faces an uphill battle if you were to win the primary what would your strategy be um would it be increasing voter turnout capturing independents traditional republicans all of the above if so how well, first thing I would be sure and do is uh, allow Madison Cawthorn to, to talk freely. <laughs> when he does that, it only benefits, you know, Democrats for sure in order to get his office. Um, I think key to this race is those, are those unaffiliated. Uh, we need to capture those unaffiliated uh, votes. They're the far fastest growing group in North Carolina and in the country. And uh, we have to be, a, I, a lot of them are, are former Republicans who feel like the party has left them, so they decided to be independent. And it's important that we we meet with them, talk with them, and let them know that uh, you know what my values are, what I believe in, is a universal thing, and that it's not a socialist or whatever the far right is calling us uh, today, communist, Marxist, whatever it is. Um, and voter turnout, getting out the vote, is always key. That's a that's. That's a nonstop thing, I believe, that we need to do it even on off years, constantly doing this to get out the vote. So how would you go about reaching the more rural counties and communities um, who are often, and also low income communities that are all often left out of the political process completely? Well, it is a challenge here because we are a district with 17 counties, as you know, 7,000 square miles about the size of Connecticut. Mm -hmm. and we have counties with 8,000, 9,000 people. So uh, one advantage I have is I am, a, I am a retired disabled vet, so I'm able to drive out to these people, meet them where they're at, not ask them to come meet me or to have to tune into a certain station, to actually get on the ground, meet with these people, let them hear what I have to say, let them ask me questions, and talk to me about what their issues are. And uh, another thing is, is we have to work hard at countering uh, that Republican message. And that's something they receive quite often through TV. And uh, just getting that good, positive message that Democrats have, you know, getting a unified message, which is very important. And that's, uh, while I am out here campaigning, that's something I'm, I'm gonna very work hard, very hard, or let me try this again, work very <laughs> hard on, is to get that unified Democratic message out. Right. So let's kind of get into your platform. On your website, it says that you're running on a platform of accountability, inclusivity, and empathy. Um, what motivated you to run for Congress, and how do you think that your experiences in the military and or other life experiences make you uniquely qualified? Because I know that you talk about that on your Why I'm Running um, page. So if you want to go ahead and address that. I you know my father's a Vietnam veteran. He depends on the VA for his health care, And he has quite a few issues as a result of that and as a result of his time as a fireman. And I so often my mother will give me a call and talk to me about how hard she had to fight just to get him to be seen, to get the right medicines, just to, to get what he deserves. I'm a, being a, a disabled vet, I have dealt with the VA as well. And it is a broken system. And other things, it relates directly to our healthcare system. Our federal government is letting us down on that, along with the VA. They're letting us down on education. 
And I've been seeing these things for decades. I've had the opportunity to live all around the country with my military service, and I'm seeing a lot of the same issues, whether it's rural or urban population, they are having problems with getting good quality education for their children. Uh, teachers not. Teachers are having to come out of pocket. The minimum wage or the, the wages that these teachers are, are given is, is abominable. Healthcare is not, has left our core behind. The ACA is a great start. It's a living document though. Has to be changed and modified to keep up. And our, especially our rural areas, they've been left behind with that. So all these things that I've been seeing for decades, I've been, you know, I, I, I don't have a college education, but I am a history buff. I do pay attention, and I have paid attention to politics since the mid-70s, when Jimmy Carter was in office. I was just five years old. Had an impact on me, though. And, you know, I, I, I've seen these issues over and over, and our government's been letting us down. And I decided after January 6th was the straw that, that broke the camel's back, as it were, I decided that I needed to get involved and get involved in a big way, that I had ideas, beliefs, abilities to make things happen in Washington that will benefit not only our district, but our entire nation. And well, I feel driven to go and, and to be a congressman, to make these issues a part of me and get these things, get these, get these issues fixed. Okay. It's been too long. So I'm going to kind of, we'll go through and sort of like pry deeper into um, a lot of the things that you brought up. So I'm kind of going by in order of the, uh, the policies that you have listed on your website that I assume are of the most importance to you. Um, so the first was veterans needs. So obviously being a veteran, this seems to be one of the bigger parts of your platform and you just addressed some of the issues that you had witnessed with your father and your mother. Um, can you, I noticed that you mentioned attempts being made to privatize the VA. Uh, can you talk more about that? Uh, what's happening there and I mean how how far along are we with that possibility or is that just some idea? Well it's been an idea uh, for a while with Republicans because I believe that Republicans see it as a way to benefit financially. They want to bring in private companies to run the VA. And uh, our present representative, Madison Cawthorn, along with some of his other far-right constituents or uh, uh, far-right fellow congressmen, congresspeople, they, they are also talking about privatizing the VA. And there's Bill, there's never gonna come a time as long as I have the ability to help change or prevent that from happening, uh, where a combat, an injured combat veteran, an injured veteran, someone that needs that, it depends on that care, is gonna have to come out of pocket for it. When you're when you receive a disability you no longer have to pay for your health care through the, the VA. But they want to privatize it, start charging co-pays, catastrophic caps, things like that. And uh, Well, and I assume make it for profit. For profit, absolutely. And, you know, I firmly believe that a, a federal, uh, federal government uh, institution is not for profit. Post office is not for, for, for profit. Our military is not for profit. The VA is not for profit. It provides a service, and that's its main reason. And, and it needs to be preserved. But it's if, if we don't get more Democrats in government, we're going to lose it. There's a good chance that we could lose it. So, other than healthcare and you know things relating to the VA, what do you think are the biggest issues facing veterans? What are their greatest needs that you would hope to address? Well, veterans have a inordinately high rate of suicide. Twenty veterans a day kill themselves. I just um, not too long ago learned about one of my soldiers from Iraq that, that ended his life. And we have to do more. We have to. And that's that's a reflection of our mental health 
system as a whole, not just the VA or a veteran. We have to destigmatize these feelings, these, these issues that people are having, this mental. There's nothing wrong with admitting that you have a problem. I, I deal with PTSD, you know, and I stood up and said, I have an issue I need, because it only benefits society as a whole. I knew that while I was in the service, not dealing with these issues head on, put my fellow soldiers in jeopardy. And so I dealt with them, and I was able to retire, you know, and uh, the, um, the suicide rate. I mean, it's just, we're not doing enough. We're not, we're not, they're, these soldiers, these, these veterans feel like they can't come out and talk about it. But that's just not the case. They can. We've become much more accepting. But it's, it's tough. I mean, it's a very tough uh, situation for them. Other things is that we have to have, we need to provide the VA services to, to uh, groups that haven't been included in the VA system, like the Blue Water Soldier, or Blue Water Navy. Uh, we need to provide better care for female veterans. They don't have enough care within the veterans, the VA system. They need, every VA clinic needs to have a gynecologist. It's pure and simple. I do feel like our, our female veterans have been overlooked for so long. While they're being more included in uh, the military, while they're able to be infantrymen, and tankers, and combat arms, they're still, it's almost like they're being treated as second class citizens. Once, especially once they get out. And those services they need to be provided for. And that's something that I understand deeply. You know, I am connected to these to these things with the VA. So our current congressman is on the veterans and veterans uh, um, board, the veterans, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The committee. 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 He's on the veterans that's, committee. That's really funny. It is, isn't it? <laughs> he has no understanding of veterans <laughs> issues. I do. Right. I would think that it would be sort of a prerequisite to be a veteran, but... You would think so? Yeah. Well, it depends on what time of year you ask him if he's... A veteran yeah, or not. or not, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, let's... I'm going to kind of shift to another aspect then. Um, so, as a veteran, you did many tours overseas. Um, what do you consider your position to be on the United States relationship with the world? Are you America first? Are you an isolationist, a globalist, an interventionist? Are we still the, the or one of the moral authorities of the world? Should we be? Well, I'll never say America first. Because as we know, that's something that the KKK used as a slogan. And we got far right conservatives using it as a slogan. So I believe that the United States has a responsibility to its allies and to anyone that requests our help in a time of need, regardless of what that need is, whether it's to help them to to uh, protect their borders for a minute, for a for a limited amount of time, if it's to help them with natural disasters, if it's to help them with what we're currently doing with COVID. So I don't think that we are what Reagan liked to call the world police. Yeah, that's not our job. We are not the moral authority for the world. Right. Okay, we don't understand their issues as well as they do. So, speaking of, you brought up um, the COVID situation. How do you think the U.S. has handled the vaccine situation um, internationally uh, thus far? And do you support the government uh, somehow forcing pharmaceutical companies to give up their patents so that the man the vaccines could be manufactured uh, elsewhere as opposed to being produced here and sent there? First off, I think uh, President Biden has done an amazing job. Uh, President Trump did help get it uh, developed, but he had no plan for distribution. President Biden walked in day one, and uh, we're better for it. The world is better for it. I firmly believe that if we have vaccinate, uh, vaccine doses to give, we give them to whomever needs them anywhere in the world. doesn't matter who they are, because preserving human life should be the, our first thought. So on the topic of, uh, of the companies, absolutely. 
they don't, this, this is not something that they need to profit from. They have plenty of other things that they can, they can sell and profit from. This is a global pandemic. We need to think globally in that sense. You know, we need to offer assistance to the other this, and that's what those companies need to be, they need to understand that, and it's in their best interest. I actually don't know whether or not the government possesses the power to force a private company to uh, relinquish a patent. Do you have? Do you know the answer to that? Uh, I don't know under certain circumstances because, for instance, um, if we're in a, a time of war, there's certain powers, the War Powers Act, the War Powers Act that, that they have a, a, a greater ability to do things. Um, I do know that we're able to force companies to retool and make certain items like ventilators. If, if that's needed during certain during a pandemic, mm -hmm. about giving up their patents, I, I don't know, um, but I think those companies would benefit greatly if they voluntarily gave them up. Do you think that China's motives in distributing vaccines around the world are altruistic, selfish motivation, both? Honestly, I have no idea. Okay, because it's just, they've been. Uh, distributing a lot of vaccines in the developing world, particularly in Africa. I have a hard time believing that a uh, communist regime such as them have altruistic motives. Okay. But I don't know. So that kind of brings me to the issue of immigration. Should we be accepting refugees at the border? how can we better handle what's happening right now? Because right now we have essentially a closed border and we have, you know, Vice President Harris making appearances in other countries saying, do not come here, quote unquote. <clears throat> I'm a first generation American. My mother escaped Poland, to es left Poland to escape communism, communism when she was 16 years old. So I understand people leaving a country, a country that, you know, she left her parents, she left everybody she knew. She had a distant cousin here that she wanted to stay near. To make that sacrifice to, to preserve your life. So I do not fault anybody who is trying to seek refuge somewhere where they, they know is safe. They're trying to, trying to take care of their children, preserve their children's lives. The, Immigration issue, the illegal immigration issue is, as you know, it's pretty complex. Uh, there's a lot of different things that drive it. Uh, some of it is uh, a lack of opportunity in their country. Some of it is fleeing natural disasters. Now with natural disasters, I believe that we do have a responsibility to help assist those countries when they experience it. And that would help stabilize their population. People would stay if they knew they were going to have help, they were receiving help at a time of a natural disaster. Improving those countries, improving their education system, it will take a generation, but it will result in increasing their abilities to work more in technologically advanced jobs. And those companies can move into those areas because they know that they have the workforce. It would stabilize their population. This is not something that we can fix overnight. Closing our borders does not fix it. It just it basically punishes those people. Um, and we have to have a, when it comes to this kind of thing, it's, it's, it's a, you have to play the, I guess, play the long game. I guess you can say that it is a long-term thing that we have to deal with. But given assisting com uh, the countries the way they need it, that they ask for, not that we shove down on them. We don't need to dump a trillion dollars in Venezuela to try to keep people from coming. It's not going to work. But to help them to grow their own economy will result in less people leaving, and that would re yeah, that would reduce our our uh, our influx of illegal immigrants. An interesting fact or interesting stat is that this past year or past two years, more people from Mexico have gone back to Mexico, Mexico than they have come into our country. Yeah, that's interesting. I have heard that before, mm -hmm. but it, yeah, it's, it's always kind of shocking. Because they're improving, they're improving their, their life of their people. That's the only way to fix it. Is that, and that's the driving reason? Yes. Okay. Um, 
So that kind of, I think, is a natural segue into your next platform point, which is the environment. Uh, obviously, climate refugeeism is also a huge issue, um, which is how I was drawing the connection between the two, and that's both domestic and international. Uh, you know, we have people being displaced in the southern hemisphere where these climates are just not inhabitable anymore. They can't. There, there's no no agriculture that can survive, et cetera, and um, water shortages that are driving people here. Um, but then we also have people fleeing the coastal areas to come to areas like Western North Carolina, which is one of the safest places that you can be in this country climate wise as we go into the future. Um, we have a relatively temperate climate. We're not particularly susceptible to natural disasters. So how will we accommodate this as it continues in your vision because it's only going to get worse. People keep saying Asheville, for example, is a housing bubble and it's going to burst. My opinion personally is that it's never going to burst because of the climate. I think other housing, this, this kind of bubble exists in a silo separate from the real estate market at large in the country. So given the negative effects that this kind of influx can have such as rising housing costs like you know you've got uh so-and-so who had a studio apartment in san francisco comes here they can buy a five-bedroom house for the same amount they think that's cheap they buy that five-bedroom house take it off the market for just themselves maybe end up renting it whatever and then you kind of have you know these situations driving up the housing costs because they're bringing in money from outside economies where their income is much higher than the income of the average uh, resident of North Western North Carolina so you know then we also have unwanted development due to both sprawl and infill destruction of ecosystems tree canopy etc so how would you respond to that concern, which I think is not on a lot of people's tongues, but is only going to become a bigger and bigger issue in this part of North Carolina? So what you're talking about, a lot of it is um, what you see in the, uh, the results of gentrification also. I mean, that's, that's something that's playing right. into it, basically. Yeah. Um, I've seen it before. I've seen it in other cities. What's this? This movement gets kicked off by there being such a huge inequity of pay for people. Those people who uh, were able to rent these homes or own these older homes can no longer afford them be simply because of the taxes, and they are not getting equitable pay in order to stay in these homes. So they're becoming available, and these people who only see profit walk in with their cash. A lot of people from you know that are, that are, that are lucky enough to have that much kind of money and sitting in their bank come in, buy it up, develop it, turn around and sell it for, I mean, you'd see a house, two houses built on a single house plot and then they're selling them for a million dollars. And they're driving the local population out. And uh, you talk about a lot of the, the effects of climate change, that's a whole, uh, let me grab that at the end. But this movement, you know, we've seen we've seen this as also the result of urban renewal. A nice way of saying the government has stolen your property or paid you so little and forced you off your property. And a few weeks ago, I attended a uh, a uh, speaker series on on uh, in Asheville on the. Uh, reparations. And what they had talked about is the urban renewal and a need to return those properties to those families because they denied them the right to establish generational wealth. And that's what's happening with this pay inequity. Uh, a big disparity in pay results in a loss of a loss of equality as well. And these 
this exploding housing market, I mean, it is a direct result of people not being able to maintain their properties because they are not making enough money. A lot of this, and, and it's unfortunate that you come to this realization halfway through it or when it's too late, but it's never too late. We can recover some of this. We can change this. And it's happening all over the country. So it's a tough thing to try to fight because honestly, you wind up leaving it up to the individual owner on whether they want to turn out that, uh, that offer that's a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars over what the value of the property is it's put it in cash but there has to be a fair housing regulations to establish that okay, these, these are these are what were traditionally thought of as red line communities we need to protect those communities not allow these developers to come in and, and gentrify these places this is not just Asheville. This is, like I said, it's happening everywhere. Right. And and it, the federal government needs to work with the state governments, working with the local governments to ensure that they are requesting the money for, for, for affordable housing, that they're getting it, it's being overseen, properly used, developing new uh, affordable housing. They need to give relief to people who are property owners that are getting buried just by taxes alone. For instance, Austin, Texas. Property, a uh, $350,000 house, you're paying $1,200 a month in taxes. Well, even if you own it and you're retired, you can't afford to live there anymore because you're paying more than what you're, as much as what you're getting in is taxes. Wow. This is a reality, and this is, this is a reality that comes to growing cities. How does that compare to Asheville or Hendersonville? I pay, nine, I pay a little over $900 uh, a year okay. for a house that's, you know, mid twos. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, the, the cost of living here is wonderful. Right. But well, it's there. <laughs> it compare. I mean, as relatively it, speaking, not right. not including real estate. Right. In order, you know, but and even rent is un, is unfair, especially for the economy that we have. But we, we've got to find a way. We've got to develop these plans to discourage this gentrification, to preserve these these uh, historic areas, to give back the land to these people who lost their land to urban renewal. I do agree with you as far as the urban renewal and reparations thing, and we, we'll come back to that later. So let, let's kind of look at that as a separate topic. Okay. But how can we, I mean, really in a, in, a, in a free market such as we have here in the United States, how can we stop people from coming here? And again, I think this is directly related to the climate this is not going to change. It's, I think this is a unique situation because of climate change that you, you know, as people in California, I just use that as an example. I'm not attacking California. I'm sorry, Californians. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, just because they do have a very bad climate situation there, then there's also a lot of money there and a lot of really expensive real estate. And so when people come here and they can just throw wads of cash, I mean, you know, how, how can you tell, like you said, how can you tell an owner, oh, <clears throat> pardon, don't sell your house for um, as much as you possibly can? Uh, there are very few people, the most altruistic among us, who would sell their house for less than they could get for it. So um, I know it's not really something that you can just like pop a quick answer out to. Uh, it's just something that I wanted to, to bring up. And also I do wanna say, I, I really like the quote on your website where you say, if we don't use stronger measures to help our planet, most issues we argue about won't even matter. It's not an inconvenience to care about the state of our earth. And so that's also related to this, because that's, let's get back, I guess, onto the topic of environment itself and off of the angle of well, real estate. It's but, okay, though, because trying to control the buying and selling of homes in a free market uh, will not end well. We are, we, we you know, this is something that's that resounds very deeply with me is we want to be able to choose. We consider ourselves you know, free in that sense that we can make a choice. If it's my property, if I choose to sell it to somebody for X amount of dollars, that's my business. But I do believe that we need to look at, at better, almost, almost, in, you know, almost in certain areas, certain large, uh, large, uh, well-developed areas, 
looking at some sort of rent control or some kind of way of controlling, you know, because a family in Hendersonville, a, a two bedroom for fourteen hundred dollars, that's that's too much. Yeah, that's it's untenable not for your average Absolutely, family. But that's yeah. what the average is. My mother in law just moved here and she was looking at apartments. Her one bedroom is more than low one bedroom to be a very nice one bedroom, but that, that doesn't matter. She's not running a house. And we have to be able to, to we've got to provide affordable housing, period, or we're going to be providing affordable housing through the city's funds or through the town's funds or through the government's funds by buying, there's been movements of buying up hotels and turning them into home, basically homeless shelters. Okay, and that's what's going to happen if we don't get a, a handle on this, especially the renting. We've got to find some way of controlling and making these things reasonable. Because greed is not good. Okay, it's okay to make a living. It's okay to get ahead. But to to profit at the expense of others is, is not that's not that is not how it, that's that's not my way. Isn't that sort of what our country was founded on? Profiting at the expense of others. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it sure was. I mean not that it's funny, it's not, but it's just but so we ridiculous. Have, but we yeah. should have moved beyond that. We're better than that. Okay, we, we're just better than that. And this isn't just a Democrat or a Republican thing. This is a an American people thing. Okay, we're we are better than that. But people, you know, it, it it's easy to 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 you can you can lie to yourself about making wow how you're making money. You know, look look at trickle down. How long have they been pushing trickle down economics? Since the eighties. It's a lie. They knew it then, they know it now. So it's not I, I believe in this, I believe in the people of this country. I believe in the overall goodness of these people. Uh, just you know, I, I. But at the same time, I've seen I've seen a lot of things, a lot of bad. And um, but I think in the end that we can, you know, I don't know. I mean, honestly, it, it's. Well, how about, I'll, let's segue into what do you this, what yeah. do you think <laughs> about? So I mean, do, that this is right up the same. Topical alley. What do you think about a wealth tax, tax reform for corporations and the super rich? I and mean, just to clarify, we're not talking about people who make 150 thou a year, or anything even close to that. So, what you know? What do you think about the fact that um, you and I together probably paid more taxes <laughs> than Jeff Bezos? Um, I paid more taxes easily than Jeff Bezos. So he paid nothing. Yeah. So. <clears throat> well, I think he paid like a fraction of a percent this year, I, if I'm not mistaken. I just want to give credit where it's due. Uh, <laughs> the working class has supported this, com this country for a very long time. To the point where we're just used to it. We just accept it. And I don't accept it. Okay. Starting this run has really opened my eyes to a lot of different things. Even before I knew things, but I'm really getting into the weeds on things and understanding more. The corporate tax is under Trump, it's cut, cut down to, I believe, somewhere around 23%. Prior to Reagan, it was in the 70s. He cut it down, it kept getting cut down. Um, Obama brought it up a little bit. Trump dropped it way down. Okay, we need to, we need to re increase that. Okay, another thing of, of how much money is enough money. We need to equitably tax everybody, equitably. I don't, I'm not asking for extra taxation on people that are ultra rich, but we need to tax them on their wealth, not on their income, because they, they hide their, in, their wealth, they hide their income and make it as if they were making nothing. And that's why they pay so little. So we tax them on their wealth, and it's okay. If you can buy a $10 billion yacht, you can pay a little bit extra in taxes. We need to increase tax the tax rate on people on single people making over two hundred fifty thousand dollars, couples making over five hundred thousand dollars. Okay, that's not going to be a big burden on them. We do not need. We need to lower the tax rate on people on the working class. We pay too much. Every year, I have to I have to write a check, and you know it's public knowledge what I make because I am a retired sergeant first class with twenty years. I make nineteen thousand dollars. What's my tax taxable income? Okay, and I am paying more, you know, 
quite a bit more than, than, than Mr. Bezos and other the other super rich. I'm writing it because I don't even have enough taxes taken. I have to I have to write a check, and the burden needs to be taken off the working class to allow them to to uh, thrive, and it needs to be put on those people that have the money, that have that that additional cash that they can pay that stuff. Yeah, I mean, people on Social Security, pe on, you have to pay taxes out of your unemployment benefit, which you paid taxes into in the first place. Mm -hmm. You already paid for Your it. unemployment insurance mm -hmm. tax. Um, so, okay, th I think another issue that affects that that's an you know an issue of inequity economic socioeconomic inequity is education which is another one of your platform topics um you say that you want to increase federal funding but decrease federal oversight what we want to do is not we we don't want a repeat of no no child left behind okay Okay, which actually uh, helped to uh, greatly um, hurt, especially rural communities. You were being punished for not performing well on tests, which is a complete opposite of what should be happening. You should be helped and you should be given more aid if you're not testing well in order to help those children not be left behind. Right. Okay, we need to increase federal funding without increasing the oversight. The government can can have oversight of where the funding goes, just a, a simple check. But it's up to the states and school districts what their curriculum is, how they're testing, how they're maintaining that. Because so you don't believe in standard curricu standardized curriculum. I I don't believe in standardized. I don't believe in a well. See, the, the Department of Education doesn't give you doesn't assign standardized curriculum. The federal government doesn't do that. That's up to the states. If that's what they wish to do, that's what they do, because that's their responsibility. All the Department of Education does is it provides best practices, it disperses best practices to, every, to everyone across the nation, so all the teachers get this information, and it ensures uh, that, that children of all different races, they're equally, they, have, they have equal access to education. That's its two main missions, that's it. It has money, it has, a very, it has the third largest budget, but it has the smallest staffing who is not using its budget for that. It's providing money for education, providing money for college students. It is, and, and that's its job, right? It's provide the funding. And it, uh, we need to increase that funding because it's not enough. We, our rural schools are closing. Their teacher to, to, to student ratio is out of control. They have dilapidated buildings. There's no child to go to school and have to worry about his health. He should be able to open his, his, his textbook and it be a current textbook. To have the, the access to, the, uh, uh, access to, to uh, current technology, which brings me to broadband. Broadband's a totally over, overarching thing. But every child should have an uh, equal playing field. Whether you live in Asheville, you live in Franklin, you live in Cherokee, Regardless of where you live, you have the same access, the same education opportunities. Teachers, they're our biggest resource. They influence our children almost as much as, as, as their parents. As this, to me, it's the second most important person in their life outside of their parents. You know, they, they need to be, they don't need to, they should get a four year free education for, to get a teacher's degree. They should have a federally mandated minimum starting wage of $45,000. See, you're uncommitting to things in my platform because I believe in them that strongly. Right? Forty-five thousand dollars. Of course, in different areas, it's going to be more. In New York, but it's got to be a minimum. We have to have a minimum wage for teachers. They have to be valued again as they were in the past. In the '70s, teachers were one of the highest-paid bachelor degrees coming out of college. They are now one of the lowest. That's that's a crime. That's a travesty. It's pretty shocking. It is terrible. So. I have a question about, I you know you had, you, you, you want to standardize the technology package availability or whatever, and, and yeah. I assume going with that, textbooks, et cetera, you know, we want to be able to offer a baseline to every single child in the country. But my question is, how do we really level the playing field when, and this is a current problem anyway, 
when rich communities can make their schools superior so therefore no matter what the standard is no matter what baseline standard you accept you you implement even if it's way higher than what we have now um, you're still going to have wealthy communities they're going to raise their standard even higher and so they're still going to be producing children out into the world who grew up in a more advantaged situation with more knowledge of technology, more access, et cetera. So how can, I mean, is there any way to truly level the playing field when you have that going on? Should people in rich communities be allowed to do all this fundraising for public schools? So, <clears throat> can I see if I understand? What you're saying is, is with the rich communities, they're able to provide, like the parents are able to provide fundraising for the school system, right? To allow them to be able to spend more money, right? Um, and that's a reality. Uh, but we have to give. Not that it's excuse me. You can't combat. You can't combat that because it's if if a, if a parent is is wanting to donate and they have the means, then that's the reality. Right. right? We try. Texas does something. It's it's basically um, they they do for. Your school taxes, they do a, a sharing throughout the entire state. Mm. Okay? Sounds great. It, uh, in reality, you know, you have school systems that would normally have no issue with enough money for their teachers to not have to come out of pocket. It's coming out of pocket because that extra funding was, was taken away to give it out. So, what we need to do, what they're not doing though, is they're not starting at a base. They're not. The government isn't stepping forward. The Texas government wasn't stepping forward and bringing those schools up to a certain level without affecting other schools. So we want to bring our schools up to this high, high level. So if a school in a poor rural community needs more money, say we give a school in Asheville, a school, uh, the school district in Asheville, just for instance, a million dollars. That school system in the rural district has $3 million to get started, to get, a, get on a level playing field, to get a jump start. That's what should have been happening with No Child Left Behind. It wasn't. We get them up to that. We can't, if a parent wants to give money to a school system, it's, there's nothing you're going to be able to do about it. Right, you right. And, and I'm certainly not suggesting that you wouldn't want to create that higher you know, baseline threshold for what students have access to mm -hmm. in their classroom. I guess I was just pointing out this sort of um, endless chain of inequity that it's so hard to battle, you know, no matter what we do. But, um... But go real quick, though. We do have school systems that are so low. Oh, yeah. Just bringing them up is going to make such a big, huge change. Yeah. Oh, I think you're right. Absolutely. Um, and you also promote, uh, propose free community college. One thing about that, anyone currently who has a drug-related offense cannot get a Pell Grant or a federal student loan. I mean, this could be a weed possession charge all the way up to a kingpin. So you can be an actual rapist and get <laughs> more or less free community college through Pell Grants, but a drug user who has been convicted cannot. So even if we couldn't get free community college, would you support, you know, removing that um, stipulation from people's eligibility to get Pell Grants and federal student aid? So what you're saying is that there's no common sense test when it comes to this. They need to put in a common sense test. You know, a guy that got busted for possession of weed is nowhere near a rapist, like you're saying, or a... a Hardcore drug dealer, anything like that. Yeah, I agree. There's got to be, there's got to be, there's got to be a line, and they've got to, they, it's got to use common sense in this, right? Right. And it's not that hard. They just gotta, they've got to relook at it, and it's got, it's got to have. Uh, and I'm hoping that'll happen, especially with uh, President Biden, that we don't have uh, Betsy DeVos anymore in charge of. Yeah. Well, that that particular thing, that's. I'm no, I don't know when it was implemented, but it's been around for a while. I mean, that's at least Obama era. Um, so, and that's something that you put me in office, I will take a look at because 
I didn't. I wasn't aware 100 percent of that. I know that there were certain stipulations. I wasn't sure of all of them. I didn't know all of them. That's yeah. interesting, and that's and that's ridiculous. We've gotta have you, common sense when we <laughs> when we do our laws, we do our regulations, and how we keep people allowing people to get access to something. It's got to be common sense thing. Yeah. When you fill out your FAFSA, which is the application for mm -hmm. federal aid. It doesn't ask you if you're a felon. It only asks you if you've been convicted of a drug-related offense, which would then shut down your entire application. So anyway, I'm going to move us along because we've got 15 minutes left. So healthcare, obviously, that's a huge thing. You've touched on it already a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, your website mentions that the ACA caused service reduction in rural areas. How, how so? How did that drive that change? Well, they didn't have the money for the clinics. They didn't have the money for the hospitals. There's 21 percent of our of our population in North in District 11 that don't have health care. How is that related to the ACA? Because they couldn't afford it. But they had health care before. They may not have had health. The point of ACA was to give universal health care. Right, I understand that, but I mean, if you didn't have health care before, and you don't have it now that's not driving but it the has actually the increase the amount of health of people without health care it's not it it hasn't been the the fix all that they were hoping it was they thought it was well i think we all see it as a flawed you know plan i'm just wondering just in that particular case if that was the driving factor or for example if what might have been more so a driving factor would be uh, that we didn't expand Medicaid in this state, for example. Uh, when you have these populations, these rural populations tend to be on the lower income side and they tend to be uninsured. So a Medicaid expansion would have been enormous mm -hmm. and would have incentivized, I would assume, providers to either move to or remain in those rural areas and I just happened I was looking this up online today since 2010 119 rural hospitals have closed from the Carolinas to California and 47 percent of the remaining facilities are currently facing negative operating margins in rural communities so yeah do you think also another thought was federal subsidies for rural providers to make up for, frankly, the lack of profitability that's driving them to other markets? Is that an idea that you would support? That's not something I've looked into. I haven't really investigated or looked into that very well. Okay. I do know that, though, that the state having the option to not expand Medicaid, since it's, it, the state turned the money down, mm -hmm. okay, we have to take that ability of the state to restrict what its what its residents can have for health care, what they what can be made available to them, we have to take it out of their hands. In this instance, I believe in a federally funded option. Okay, because these rural communities would benefit from that. They would see no cost health care, all encompassing health care, provided by the government. So the federal government, so that the state cannot step in and say no, no, no. We want our private hospitals because we like. As Republicans, a Republican-run state, we want to maintain our profitability. Okay, so we take that, we give them health care, health, mental health care, vision, uh, hearing, dental, and prescription. All right, and then the government is able to control that cost because they're able to influence those costs. All right, with with the uh, prescriptions. The prescriptions are no are no cost. They need to they need to look at establishing all encompassing um, all encompassing clinics within those rural communities. Get those back in there. So I understand that the hospitals are, are, are they're just they're they're dying out there. They have no workers. They have no money. They're not getting the money because people can't afford to go to the hospitals. And uh, as far as what you're saying, it's a it's a great point. I'm going to look into it more so. Um, but I do believe that that. With the healthcare system, we have to maintain choice. People want a choice. If they want to pay more for their health care, that's on them. So what do you think about <clears throat> the, I mean, this is everybody's hot uh, phrase, Medicare for all. Do you think that, obviously I, I hear that you're saying you do support um, a universal health care option, a federal option. 
Um, do you like the Medicare for all model or do you think that that's maybe being misbranded or? I believe, like I said before, that we Americans want to have a choice. Whether it's the best choice for them or not, they don't always pick their own. You know, they right. don't always make the best decisions for themselves, but they want to maintain a choice. Right. So a take Canada, for instance, they went to a single payer option. They introduced that as an option. Majority of the country is now on that option because they saw the wisdom of it, but they were given the choice. They came to it. A federally funded option, we give that out. Okay, my, my federally funded option is not just, you know, the poor and rural communities that can't afford the health care at a certain income rate, they get it free. If you're above that income, it's a sliding scale, right, which is a very effective way of, of preventing or presenting health care for people. And uh, they'll come to it. I believe that people will start moving to it. I don't think introducing a Medicare for all and forcing people onto it is going to be beneficial. Right. Well, I think it's interesting that a lot of Medicare for all proponents suggest, I mean, they you point out the, obvi the obvious, which is that we're the only industrialized country in the world that doesn't have universal health care. But then they somehow forget to point out that every, almost every country in the, in the world that has universal health care also has private insurance companies. And I also wonder, I think Canada and Taiwan are the only true single payer systems in the world, but even in Canada, you can still get private insurance. And interestingly, Canada apparently suppresses utilization by restricting the supply of physicians and nurses through quotas for student admissions and by restricting investments in new capital and technology. So I think we could probably make a safe argument that this might stifle innovation. Um, and so even though they still have a private insurance sector there, as you rightly pointed out, it's pr pretty minimally mm -hmm. used. Um, and so I think it just seems obvious to me, also given the fact that it's an 8.45 trillion dollar industry in the US, how could we ever shift immediately to a 100% single payer system without collapsing our economy or a good chunk of it? <laughs> yeah, no, it's not something, you know, it's not something that you can just separate or wake up the next day, sign into law, and that's it. Right. For sure. All right. So I think that's why I think with the federal, the federal option, just like what Canada did with the single payer, it, it, it allows people time to, to for, some, for some of them, it's just getting used to it, just accepting it. You know, have you ever been told something that's just like, oh my gosh, that's a horrible thing. And you're like, oh, maybe it's not so bad. Oh, you know, a couple of days later, you're like, oh no, that's actually pretty cool. Like, that's actually, that's going to work. Giving people time to react. I think people are feeling, I, I, I think a lot of people when they, when they hear Medicare for all, it's a knee jerk reaction of you're going to take away my right to choose. Right. And, and we haven't overcome that. The, the talking points by the Democrats haven't overcome that. We got to do better better job of messaging with it, but I think a option is a good way to get it started. Okay. So again, I want to keep moving. I know broadband accessibility is a huge issue for you, so mm -hmm. I want to give you an opportunity to talk about that and HB 129. Yes, House Bill 129 restricts, uh, restricts um, communities from being able to uh, establish their own broadband. It, what it does is actually, the way it's written is that it does not allow communities, uh, towns, cities, and the such, uh, from being able to directly compete with a private industry. All right. That was put in by, by a former uh, representative of, of NC11, uh, Mr. Meadows, and that is restricting our ability to treat uh, broadband as a, as a utility that it is. Okay, so it, we don't, we're not allowing towns and cities, municipalities, municipalities to be able to do that. There was one that did it very successfully, and that's what caused this reaction by the, by the powers that be, the industry. So we need to re remove the excuse of it's not affordable for a place like AT&T. Okay? We fund them to the point where they're able to establish these uh, high speed, uh, it needs to be wired in, it needs to be a direct connection, it needs to be uh, high speed and it needs to be dependable. Right? Just uh, setting up satellites and stuff doesn't work. 
not where I live. I live in the trees. There's a lot of trees. Not but literally in the trees, but there's a lot of trees around. <laughs> um, and uh, we need to be able to, uh, yeah, we need to make it so they can't use that excuse that it's not, it's not, uh, it's not cost effective because that's what's happening at my house right now. It's not cost effective for them to run me, run good internet to my home. Right. All right, and I can't convince them otherwise. Right, and I think you could usually. It's like they they'll tell you, well, you can pay for it yourself, which is untenable for almost everybody, especially people living in rural communities. Yeah, a mile of broadband is. Oh, it's thousands of. It's like three hundred thousand dollars for them to come around it. But the thing is, though, is we have we have the infrastructure. We have every home in the nineteen thirties. Roosevelt did the Tennessee, uh, the Tennessee uh, uh, power initiative, where he ran. Tennessee Valley Power, where he ran, he was able to run wire to every single house. Every house in America that wanted electricity got it. Those poles are up. It's there. This is not as big of a hurdle as people think it is. It is, it is attainable. We just have to push it. Okay. At the federal level. Um, so you talked earlier about a little bit about reparations for black Americans and those otherwise harmed by urban renewal projects um, since restoration after World War II, is this a federal issue, do you believe, the issue of reparations, or should we, as has been done thus far, leave it up to local municipalities and or states to decide if to implement it and how to? I think, I think local, what I'm seeing here in Asheville from a little bit of the speaker uh, engagement that I was at, that the local municipalities they don't know how to do this there's no standard there's only four municipalities that are doing this right now there's one in ohio providence rhode island here and then there's one more and i, I you're gonna get me lying if i tell you what it is but they evanston. uh what is it evanston evanston yes illinois illinois so but they're all they don't know what they're doing there's nothing wrong with setting up a federal commission that can help them guide them Give them the resources they need in order to do this. Build a model. If Build a model, as it were. Yes, and that's what we could do. We can do that at the federal level and allow those towns and those cities and those and those uh, states to have a resource to go to. They don't have that right now. And while Asheville voted it in, what last year? They're, uh, year, yes. they're years away from getting it implemented because they don't know how. Correct. Well, yeah, I think they're they're just they're definitely trying to figure it out. But mm -hmm. like and you they're said, they're doing a good job. There's, there's no roadmap. There's no roadmap. Well, I guess well there could be anyway. I can't go off on. <laughs> we don't have time for a huge digression. Before we wrap up, and I'm going to do a little rapid fire of questions at sure. the end. Is there any other topic that you'd like to quickly address? Environment. Okay, there's a lot of opportunities right right now. The Green New Deal is a great idea. There's a lot of good things in that. We're not there technologically. We're getting there. There are a lot of new technologies, technological advances that are helping this. Simple things as putting in a little machine that wipes off the solar panels every day instead of having to waste water washing them down. We have a new thing that I've been reading about, not fairly new, of, of carbon labeling, where we're labeling, some companies are taking the initiative to label their items with the carbon, of, the carbon footprint that it that took to make that, that mm -hmm. item. It needs to be <coughs> standardized, it needs to be, and it needs to be brought out to all the, com all the industries. Okay, so I'm going to just do a quick rapid fire. A um, couple of these might be redundant, but just to summarize, and these are just yes or no or a couple word answers. Sure. Legalization of marijuana. Yes. Decriminalization of drugs. Depending on the drugs. Death penalty. Okay, we'll just move on. Okay, <laughs> legality and accessibility to abortion. Uh, yes, it needs to say and be and be expanded. Yes. Okay, assault rifle ban. Uh, weapons of war have no business in our communities. All right, mandatory mandatory mental health screening for gun ownership. Uh, nice, but I don't believe it's it's, it's untenable at this time. Okay, um, trans women in sports. Women in sports. Okay. And all right. Emerging bills restricting children from medically transitioning. Need to be squashed. Okay. Done away with. All right. Universal basic income. Yes. Defunding the police. No. Bad choice of words. Uh, we need to reallocate funding for the police and increase funding in some instances. Okay. All right. Well, once again, 
You've been listening to WPVM 103.7 on your dial and globally at WPVMFM.org. Thank you again to NC11 Congressional Candidate Jay Carey for joining us in the studio tonight to share his platform and views with the community. If you wish, you may find more information about Jay Carey at the website jcareyforcongress.com or on the Jay Carey for Congress Facebook page. Don't forget that you can view this broadcast archived on WPDM's Facebook page or website. And thank you so much for joining us this evening, and make sure to tune in to our next interview with Republican NC11 candidate Wendy Navarez and other future candidate interviews on WPVM.